Gaudeamus omnes in domino, diem festum celebrantes, sub honore sanctorum omni. Welcome to The Way of the Fathers, a podcast sponsored by CatholicCulture.org. I'm your host, Mike Aquilina. In today's episode, we encounter a remarkable witness to history, John of Damascus. Tradition tags him as the last of the fathers. And so, this will be the final episode of the first season of The Way of the Fathers. The next time we meet, we'll talk about some themes in the history of the early church. After that, We'll explore the seven ecumenical councils. So even though this will be the last of our character sketches of individual fathers, we still have so much to see and so much to learn about their times. I think it's going to be a very good year, a year of memorable stories from the most distant Christian past. John of Damascus was witness to the end of a world. In the 7th century, the lands that were once home to Eastern Christianity had fallen rapidly to the invading armies of the Arabs. These tribes, nomadic and mostly polytheist, had long been an annoyance to the Byzantine order, terrorizing towns and cities at the edges of the empire. Situated in the Arabian Peninsula, they could exploit the weaknesses of both the Byzantines to the west and the Persians to the east. By the end of the 6th century, both world powers, both empires, were exhausted from fighting each other and fighting plague. Though the Byzantines emerged victorious from the wars, their resources were depleted, and their emperors were despised by their faraway subjects, who bore the brunt of the wars with Persia. Meanwhile, the Arabs grew in number. They were limited mainly by their clannish divisions and rivalries. Into that world around 570 AD was born Muhammad. He grew up to be a merchant and led a fairly conventional life, until around 610 he reported having visions of angels, who summoned him to a mission as a prophet. Muhammad's revelations at first repelled and then attracted those around him. They took the shape of a religion. Like Judaism and Christianity, the religion of Muhammad traced its origins back to the historical figure of Abraham, and the prophet borrowed freely from the Christian and Jewish accounts of historical events. But these were radically reinterpreted. In Muhammad's telling of the story, Ishmael is the favored son of Abraham, and Ishmael's descendants, the chosen people. By long tradition, the Ishmaelites were identified with the Arabs. First slowly, then rapidly, the Arab peoples united behind Muhammad's religious vision. He emerged as their warlord and led them in one after another successful invasion of Byzantine and Persian territory. The Arabs fought with a sense of divine mission, a fearlessness in the face of death, and a ruthlessness on the battlefield. One after another, the Christian lands fell and the imperial armies were routed. Palestine, Syria, Egypt, Mesopotamia, Libya, Morocco, Visigothic Spain. The onslaught continued with undiminished momentum even after the death of Muhammad in the year 632. When Muslim forces arrived at a city, they would offer terms to the inhabitants. If these were accepted, the city could expect a relatively peaceful transition to the new regime. If the terms were rejected, the ensuing fight would be fierce and the Christian populace would be brutally suppressed. In 635, Damascus surrendered on terms. The man who negotiated terms on behalf of the Christian inhabitants was Mansur ibn Sarjun, a treasury official of the Byzantine regime. Under the Muslim conquerors, Mansur would continue his work of tax collection, and eventually he would pass it on to his son Sergius, who would then pass it along to his own son, John. And that man, John, the third generation of the Mansur family to serve the Muslim caliphate, was our John of Damascus. Yet his family was devoutly and defiantly Christian. They maintained their faith in spite of intense pressure to convert. 
They maintained their public office because their overlords valued their knowledge and skill. John was born around the year 675. The little reliable information we have about him is what we glean from his writings and those of a handful of his contemporaries or near contemporaries. The earliest biography we have is imaginative and entertaining, but seems to be largely fabricated, centuries after John's death, by an author who was ignorant of John's work. The biography actually contradicts John's own assertions at many points. We know that John grew up in Damascus, a Syrian city that appears often in both the Old and New Testaments of the Bible. After the Muslim conquest, it became the capital city of the Umayyad Caliphate. From John's extensive writings, it is clear that he received an excellent education. He wrote with erudition and eloquence. His body of work includes many genres of prose and many forms of poetry. He was fluent in both Greek and Arabic and familiar with the Greek tradition in philosophy and the sciences. His own ethnic background was probably Arabic. Around the year 706, the Caliphate initiated a program of Islamicization and Christians were banned from civil service. This would have had an immediate and devastating effect on John's family, and so on John himself. It seems likely that he would have followed his father and grandfather in public office, and some near contemporary sources indicate that he did. A sudden change in fortunes may have created a crisis for him, or it may have presented itself as an opportunity a chance for him to pursue a course he had already planned for himself. We don't know. What we know is at some point in adulthood, he discerned a call to monastic life, and he journeyed more than 200 miles to enter the famous Marsaba Monastery near Jerusalem on the eastern side of the Kidron Valley. The monastery was known for its great library and its austere life. It is still standing today and still occupied by monks. If you visit, you can see John's tomb there and the cell where he lived and worked. At Marsaba, John immersed himself in the writings of the Eastern Fathers. In his studies, he favored the Cappadocians, Basil, and the two Gregories. But he seems to have mastered a wide range of other authors. Of the Western Fathers, he quotes only Pope Leo the Great. John was ordained to the priesthood and served the local bishop by preaching at Jerusalem's major shrines on the great feast days. His life was ordered and quiet until events in the Christian world required skills that John possessed in abundance. The Byzantine emperor, Leo III, was intensely aware of the empire's vulnerability. He had been born and raised in Syria. He spoke Arabic and was familiar with the emerging Islamic culture. As emperor, he repelled the Muslim forces after their year-long siege of the capital city, Constantinople. But he continued to suffer setbacks, rebellions in the West, barbarian incursions at the other frontiers, and the slow but constant advance of the caliphate at the eastern edges of the empire. He became convinced that these terrors represented God's judgment upon Byzantine Christians for their infidelity. At first, he tried to appease the deity by forcing Jews and others to be baptized. With increasing certainty, however, he became convinced that the problem was nearer and more pervasive than the existence of a few religious outsiders. It's possible that Leo, in his Eastern upbringing, had heard Muslim arguments against the Christian use of religious images. The Umayyad Caliphate looked with suspicion upon the depiction of living things in any religious context. They believed that the danger of idolatry was too great. Their attitude crept into secular contexts as well, as they removed representational design elements from their coins as well. We don't know how Leo got the idea, but he got it bad, and it became an obsession. The Christian empire was suffering, he believed because its people had become idolatrous in their exaltation of religious icons. So he sprang into action. There was a prominent image of Jesus at the gate of his palace in Constantinople. Leo commanded that it be removed immediately. When bystanders saw what the workmen were doing, they were furious. They surged as a mob and killed the crew. But the emperor was not intimidated. Indeed, he upped the stakes. 
he issued an edict forbidding all religious artwork, and he sent out his agents to seize and destroy whatever religious images they found. What followed was a series of horrors. Since the most conspicuous Christian art was in churches, its destruction entailed repeated and forceful acts of desecration and destruction of property long considered to be sacred. Devout Christians were appalled, and some were moved to violent opposition. Some died as martyrs rather than hand over their icons to these thugs. Leo and his agents became known as iconoclasts. The word means literally picture smashers. Leo enforced his iconoclasm with a passionate vengeance, and he held absolute power over the military. But nowhere did he find a groundswell of popular support. The Christian subjects looked at their emperor and saw an increasing resemblance to their enemies in the Muslim caliphate. This is when John of Damascus stepped decisively out of the shadows of his enclosure at Marsaba Monastery. In the years 728 to 730, he wrote what would become his most famous work, his three apologetic discourses against the iconoclasts. These are not three different arguments, but rather the same argument, reworked and expanded for different occasions. In his refutations, John appealed to scripture, tradition, and common sense. He acknowledged that the Old Covenant forbade prayer before images, but now, he added, the Incarnation has changed everything. He wrote, In former times, God, being without form or body, could in no way be represented. But today, since God has appeared in the flesh and lived among men, I can represent what is visible in God. I do not worship matter, but I worship the Creator of matter, who became matter for my sake, and who through matter accomplished my salvation. Next, he listed the times when God either commanded or approved the making of images. Moses' raising of the bronze serpent in the desert. The figures of cherubim woven round the Ark of the Covenant. And the angels of gold in Solomon's temple. Yet all these, though commanded by God, would be forbidden by the Emperor Leo and his iconoclasts. John went on to make a now classic distinction that may be his greatest contribution to theology. He explained the difference between latreia, which is adoration or worship due only to God, and proskinesis, which is honor or veneration given to creatures. A Christian offers latreia in prayer to God and in the liturgy. He offers proskinesis to his parents, to civil authorities, to the flag, to the saints and angels, and to the images and relics of Christ. Said John of Damascus, Discern between the different kinds of worship. Abraham bowed down to the sons of Hamor, men who had neither faith nor knowledge of God. Jacob bowed to the ground before Esau, his brother, and also before the tip of his son Joseph's staff. He bowed down, but he did not adore. Joshua and Daniel bowed down in veneration before an angel of God, but they did not adore him. For adoration is one thing, and that which is offered in order to honor something of great excellence is another. John also pointed out that Leo's purge was a sort of class warfare. While the men of the imperial court had the leisure to read and the money to buy books, most people did not. Many, if not most, were illiterate. To deprive them of icons was really to deprive them of the gospel stories, or as John himself put it, since not all know letters, nor do all have the leisure to read, the fathers deemed it fit that these events should be depicted as a sort of memorial and terse reminder. It certainly happens frequently that at times when we do not have the Lord's passion in mind, we may see the image of his crucifixion, and being thus reminded of his saving passion, fall down and adore. John's arguments were circulated widely in the eastern lands and became influential in the church's resistance of the government. He stated repeatedly that the emperor and his agents possessed no doctrinal authority whatsoever, that they were, in fact, subject to the bishops in such matters. But the emperor Leo was having none of that, and his program of iconoclasm continued until his death and beyond. 
It was taken up with vigor and rigor by his son Constantine V, who reigned for 34 years. Constantine had such a raging hatred of John of Damascus that he refused to speak his name, John Mansur, and referred to him instead as John Manzer, which means John the Bastard. But history exacts its own revenge, and turnabout is fair play. Constantine was despised by his subjects, who gave him the vulgar nickname Capronimus. Even today, he appears in genealogies and histories as Constantine Capronimus, Constantine whose true name is Excrement. John's reputation has fared better in the Christian world. He was the author of many books besides his tracts against iconoclasm. His masterpiece is called The Fountain of Wisdom, and it is a comprehensive, systematic presentation of theology, drawing richly from the fathers who lived before John. It also repurposes the best parts of John's other works. The Fountain of Wisdom is divided into three parts, each of which is quite substantial. The first part is a presentation of philosophy collected from the fathers, as well as from Aristotle, Porphyry, and other philosophers. The second part is a historical review of false religious doctrines, including more than a hundred heretical propositions, and ending with iconoclasm and Islam. The third and final part is a positive and extensive exposition of the Christian faith. In recent years, there has been much discussion of John's treatment of Islam in his review of heresies. The chapter is important because it is one of the earliest examinations by an outsider of Islam as a religion and a set of doctrines. John considers Islam as a Christian heresy, claiming that Muhammad first learned about God from an Aryan monk who taught him Aryan doctrine. John does not say that Muhammad became a Christian of any sort. He does not present Muhammad as a fallen Christian, but rather as someone who received corrupted doctrine and then further corrupted it. Islam does, of course, hold much in common with Arianism, the rejection of the doctrine of the Trinity, for example, and the belief that the Word of God was neither co-eternal with God nor co-equal with God. Interestingly enough, John's claims arose later in history, in medieval Islamic sources, where Arius appears as a precursor to Muhammad's doctrine. That small chapter in John's Fountain of Wisdom has gained an outsized amount of attention in recent years. It's important, but it is only one chapter in a large work that is important for many other reasons. The Fountain of Wisdom is monumental, and John continued to refine it throughout the remaining years of his life. In its content, if not its form, it anticipates the great summas of the Middle Ages. Several versions have survived, so we can compare its progress as John expanded some portions and trimmed back others. In its final editions, it is a work of great beauty and intellectual majesty. John composed many other books and poetical works. At the request of bishops, he wrote apologetics against Nestorianism, Monophysitism, and Monothelitism. He wrote dialogues to expose the errors of Manichaeism in Islam and he even produced tracts to counter popular superstitions, such as the belief in dragons and witches. His most original work, the work that bears his personal stamp, so to speak, is in his homilies and his liturgical poems and hymns. He won renown for his Eucharistic and Marian hymns, which are still sung in churches today. John of Damascus, John Mansur, died in the year 749 or 750, the iconoclast program went on unabated through the reign of Constantine Capronimus and then through the reign of his son, Leo IV. Leo tried to turn up the heat, but he had even less support than his predecessors had had. Not even his wife Irene agreed with him. He was about to have her put away when he suddenly died of a fever. Irene, acting as regent for her young son, Constantine VI, called for an ecumenical council known now as the Second Council of Nicaea. It took place in 787 AD, some 37 years after John's death. 
There, the bishops restored icons to the churches, homes, and street corners, and decisively declared iconoclasm to be a heresy. As they did so, they stated explicitly that they were invoking the words and teachings of John of Damascus. I hope you've enjoyed this episode, as I hope you've enjoyed the entire first series of The Way of the Fathers. As we enter our second season, I ask you, I even beg you, to please consider making a donation. We are entirely listener-funded. Just visit us at catholicculture.org and look for the button that says Donate. We're grateful for anything you can give. We're grateful that you've listened faithfully till now. Remember, we pray for our benefactors every day. I look forward to our next time together as we tell more stories about the early church and continue our journey along the way of the fathers. Dequorum solemnitate Gauden Way of the Fathers is just one of the podcasts produced by CatholicCulture.org. To hear more from the Church Fathers in their own words, check out Catholic Culture audiobooks, readings of Catholic classics, including the Fathers and St. John Henry Newman. You might also enjoy Criteria, the Catholic film podcast, devoted to works of high artistic caliber and Catholic interest. And for interviews on a wide range of topics in Catholic arts and culture, Listen to the Catholic Culture Podcast.